Hey, welcome to Real Estate Resource. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I really hope you enjoy this video. So, uh, welcome back. Contract class, we're back. Uh, happy to be back. It's been a while. So, uh, thank you guys for being patient, and thank you for coming back. Appreciate it. All right, so any questions before I jump in? Anybody? No? No questions? All right, so I've got you guys muted. If you have any questions, probably best bet is to throw those into the chat. I'll take a look at the chat. I'll keep the chat open so I can answer any questions that you guys have. And uh, and uh, I'll ask you to unmute if it's something that we need to get into more detail on. But other than that, let's get going. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. All right. So you should be looking at right now. You should be looking at the disclosure regarding agency relationships. So again, we're starting the RPA from the beginning. Again, we've got a lot of new people that are starting to join us. And I always think it's good that we do a refresher. It's been, you know, seven or eight months, I think, since we've done this. And um, since we've taken a look at it, deep dive, talked about all the issues, the pitfalls, the, the loopholes, how to protect yourself, how to protect your clients. It's been a while since we've done it. So um, I always like to get back started with that again. And the disclosure regarding agency relationships is always the beginning. And the reason that I always try to talk about it as much as possible is because it's a form that we don't give a lot of, uh, we don't carry a lot of importance. Like it doesn't carry a lot of importance with us but it is really important. And what this form is, is just what it says it is. It's a disclosure regarding the real estate agency relationships, which means it's a disclosure to your client, whether that be buyer or seller, tenant or landlord, on how they can be represented by an agent. And there's three ways that they could be represented. As a seller's agent, which is stated here that we're looking at, as a buyer's agent, or where an agent is representing the both the buyer and seller, which we call dual agency. And that doesn't just mean the listing agent representing the seller and the listing agent rem representing the buyer. That means any agent that works under the umbrella of this brokerage or the brokerage you work for, right? So dual agency is if Century 21 All-Stars or you know whatever brokerage has the listing and also represents the buyer. So it could mean that I have the listing and, um, you know, Joseph has the buyer and we're working together in the transaction. That's dual agency. And what happens in dual agency is not only do we have to disclose to them what dual agency is, but we have to get their permission to act as a dual agent. So your seller, and your buyer both have to give you permission to act as a dual agent. And again, remember, dual agency encompasses every agent that works under a brokerage. Okay. So that's what this disclosure is. It is not a binding agreement. It doesn't say that the seller is now or the buyer is now forced to work with you. It doesn't say that you're forced to work with them. All this is, is just that a disclosure that states here's how you can be represented. Okay. And it has to be signed by every buyer, every seller, every landlord, every tenant that we represent. You have to have that signed. Okay. Now, as long as you get one of these signed and it predates any offer or any listing that you have with that client, that AD, that disclosure regarding agency relationships is valid for that client for the life of your real estate relationship with them. Okay. Uh, you only have to have it for your client. You don't have to send it with your offers, right? So when I'm writing an offer and I have my buyer sign this, I don't need to forward that with my offer. There's no need for me to show the agency disclosure that I have signed with my client to the listing agent. There's no need for me to have a copy from the listing agent. It used to be a rule. It's not any longer. So I don't need to have a copy from the seller. Okay, so this is just for your file. That's it. You don't need to share it with anybody else. Questions about the disclosure regarding agency relationships? 
anybody. Okay. Now, it has to predate or be the same date as either your listing contract or your purchase agreement. In this case, we're talking about the purchase agreement today. So it has to be at no later than the date that your purchase agreement is drafted. If you if your agency disclosure is dated later than your purchase agreement, then we have an issue because you had them sign a contract without first disclosing to them their rights as far as how they could be represented. And the reason I say that sometimes we dismiss how important this form is, is that there have been cases in the past where agents have been refused their commissions because they didn't have this signed at the right time, right? So an agent took a listing, forgot to have the client sign an agency disclosure, went through the whole transaction. They had a bit of a dispute where the seller was not happy with the listing agent. At the end, the seller did not want to pay the listing agent his commission and used in his defense that this disclosure was signed after the listing. And as a matter of fact, it was signed by the seller after it had already gone into escrow. So that listing agent did not get paid a commission for his work that he did selling that property. Okay. So again, we kind of just throw this around as uh, just something that we have to have in our transaction, but it is really important. The law states, this is, this is dictated by the Department of Real Estate. This isn't CAR. The Department of Real Estate says you have to have this disclosure showing proof. And technically, you have to have this even if you don't work with the client. So, for example, if I sit down with a buyer and I have a buyer consultation with that buyer, and we talk about the whole process of buying a house and what they have to go through and getting them qualified and talking about their buying power and looking at properties and all those things in that consultation, I'm supposed to have them sign this disclosure. I could get in trouble technically if I don't have this disclosure signed, even if that buyer says, you know what? I don't want to work with you. Okay. I choose not to work with you going forward. We're not going to go look at properties. I'm supposed to have this done. Anybody that I have a discussion with about real estate, technically I'm supposed to have this. Now we don't do it. Usually we generally have it because it's connected to an offer or to a listing agreement. And that's fine. It's the norm. I'm not telling you guys that you have to go out and get disclosures regarding agency relationships signed by everybody you talk to. But just know that the law does really go that strict. For us, again, just has to be done with your offer or before. And that's all you need to have it in your file for that buyer. Okay. All right. Any questions regarding the form that we just talked about? Any questions? Okay. All right. All right. Question. Yes, yes, Chris. Chris. Yeah, um, that form is uh, automatically generated once you open up like uh, the RPA, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it'll come. Yeah, it'll with come it. with it. Okay, moving on. The Fair Housing Discrimination Advisory again is just an advisory, um, and it's advising them that. There can be no discrimination based on race, class, sexual orientation, you know, color, any of that stuff. Okay. And that's, I mean, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm certain that you guys know that we can't discriminate uh, for any reason against potential buyers or against sellers. So um, we don't need to dig into this too much. Okay. One, one of the things that is in the fair housing though, is that there is a choice for the sellers to uh, accept or not accept those love letters, right? The, the letters that buyers like to write about how much they love this place and how much my family would love to, to get the, um, the property and this is our house and all. Those love letters are technically not allowed anymore. Um, it's a gray area, but in listing agreements, the sellers can choose uh, to have, uh, to, to allow love letters. Most people don't check that box. I think at this point now, just because it's been mentioned in this fair housing, don't include love letters in your offer packages, right? And so again, for those of you who don't know what the love letter is, it's a letter from the buyer to the seller, uh, you know, espousing their love for uh, the property and why they should choose their offer over somebody else's. Okay. So no more love letters. Uh, Virginia, go ahead. You have your hand up. 
So in some of our listings, you know, a lot of the agents, you can tell they're not trained to know better. I always refer to the fair housing document or um, disclosure, but mm -hmm. I do ask them to put at least a little bio in the email. So because some of my sellers do find that interesting, you know, to know, you know, their background, are they residents of the area, et cetera. Is that acceptable? Um, well, look, if, if it's something that your seller's requesting, it's acceptable. The, the thing is, is that the reason why they're dissuading people from putting that is because even though the fair housing says you can't discriminate based on who they are, they could ultimately end up discriminating against them that, you know, Hey, sorry, you know, based on what they read, it could be as little as, well, I just don't like that they have, you know, four dogs and I don't want to bother the neighbors. That's a bit of a discrimination, right? Like it could be simple, but it feels like it could get out of hand. And I think that's why CAR and NAR are like, we, we want to kind of dissuade people from that whole love letter, you know, practice just because inadvertently it could work against you. Not, but not, not on purpose, but it could work against you. Oh. Ultimately, it's the seller's choice, though, right? Where does right. that draw the line? Like, in other words, you know, the seller says that that's important for them to understand who this buyer is. You know, even if uh, I, I understand that as far as, you know, um, yeah. Well, race, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Is this the seller saying to you, hey, I want love letters or are you saying, do you want to know about the buyer? Um, sometimes I won't bring it up and then he'll say, um, do you know anything about this buyer? And so I've learned my lesson to say, I don't, but the, the, um, agent has written something. I can share it with you. That's okay. the way I've been doing it. If, if, which I, to be completely honest with you, I mean, I mean, people might in passing say, do you know anything about the buyer? I, I think that if that's something that your seller wants, by all means, do it. Should I, do I think you guys should discourage them from that and, 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 you know, have people just do it on the merits of the offer? Probably. But I just, if you want to, and somebody just put in the, in the chat, can we put in the agent remarks that love letters will not be presented to the seller? Sure. Sure. To dissuade them from sending those, you can. But I mean, if that's something that your seller wants, then by all means, tell the, the buyer's agents, hey, my seller wants to know a little bit of history on your buyers. I, I don't know if that's something that could backfire on you or not, because you got to think about this. If, if you get the love letter from them and then they don't get their offer accepted and it's a decent offer, they could start to infer that the reason they didn't get their offer accepted was because of the personal information that was shared by their agent and then turn it around to that you did something inappropriate is the reason why like your seller made their choice based on who they were personally, not based on the merits of the offer. So I just think in the climate of the world that we're in right now, because everybody is, seems to be very sensitive, sensitive and litigious, you're probably better to stay away from them. So there is no, even the, there can't even be an implied reason that you didn't accept my offer was because you didn't like what I wrote in my letter. And I think you should tell your sellers that, Hey, let me, let me explain to you why I think that this is something that you should not want is because they can now say that you didn't choose my offer because you didn't like me because my last name or because of you figured out that I was, you know, not white or whatever the, the issues may be. You don't want to open up that can of worms, whether it happens one out of a thousand, you don't want to be that one. So I think that all okay. of you guys should be dissuading those love letters. Okay. Thank you. But that's my opinion. Your business, you'd handle your business the way you want to. And if your clients are adamant that they want it, well, then we have to do, we have to provide customer service to our client, right? You're not going to say, way, no, absolutely not. No. And the way I'm presenting it to the agent is just give us a basic bio, but no photos, please. Yeah. I, I, again, that's uh, your business, your choice, okay. however you want to okay. handle it and whatever your client wants. I think I just, my okay. opinion is. I would rather stay away from it just so I don't open myself and my sellers up to the fact that somebody might say, you didn't choose me because of my letter, you know? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? All right. All right. So next, possible representation of more than one buyer or seller disclosure and consent. So remember a few minutes ago when we were talking about the disclosure regarding agency relationships and we were talking about dual agency. 
And I said that part of that dual agency responsibility is that we have to get the permission of the seller or the buyer to act as a dual agent. That's what this form does. The, the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller disclosure and consent does that. Having your client sign this, what it does is it discloses to them a bit about how the market works, how dual agency works, and it gets their consent on dual agency. So what it breaks down here, and we're not going to read the whole thing because it's a lot, but it talks about multiple buyers. And what it says is that the broker, right, that I work for, that you work for, that we work for, may represent more than one buyer that are all looking for the same thing, okay? And we're not going to restrict or limit anybody's availability of properties or or making an offer because we have another buyer that also is looking for the same thing, right? So it'd be like saying, there's a listing across the street that's a three bedroom, two bath for $600,000. And I have a buyer that wants it and, and, and Virginia has a buyer that wants it and Adrian has a buyer that wants that property. And we were to say, okay, well, you know, Kyle showed up first, so only his buyer gets to write an offer. You guys have to go show something else. We don't do that. And that's what it's saying is that we're not going to restrict you from having the right to write an offer. We're going to write all three offers on that same, even if it's our own listing, right? We're going to write all those offers. We're not going to restrict anybody from doing that. And whichever offer gets accepted, that's just how the market works. The seller picks the best offer. Okay. And it works that same way with multiple sellers, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Seller. We may have five or six listings that are identical to yours in the same market area. Okay. But we're not going to restrict any of the buyers from seeing your property because we don't want them, we don't want them to see this one. We want them to buy that other list. Okay. That's basically what this is dig, talking about with multiple buyers and multiple sellers. And then dual agency, it breaks down. Like I talked about the dual agency is not just the listing agent working with the seller and the buyer, but it's any agent that works under the umbrella of the brokerage that may be representing a buyer on our listing or vice versa. That's, that's also dual agency and it breaks that down here. Okay. What it does say as far as dual agency in here is it says that the, the broker is prohibited from sharing any confidential information, right? So it means if I'm the listing agent and I now procure a buyer, so I'm representing both sides, right? I'm, let's look at the traditional double end. I'm double ending it. It's a dual agency situation. This says that as a dual agent, I cannot tell the buyer what the seller's bottom line is, right? So I can't call my buyer and go, look, if you write your offer for this much, right? For 650,000, I know the buyer, the seller will take it because that's their bottom line, even though it's listed at 700. I can't do that. And I can't say to the seller, look, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I know that they, you know, you're listed for 700 and they only offered 690. It's because they're trying to get a deal. I know they can afford 700 and I know that they'll buy, they'll, they'll continue with the purchase at 700. So let's counter them back at 700. I can't do that. I can't, I can't share with them how much money they have, right? I can't share with the, any, I can't share with the buyer's agent, any financial difficulties that the seller is having that may cause them to not be as strong a seller or like, I mean, if it's a notice of default and public record and things like that, that's fine. But I mean, like I, unless there's a lawsuit involved that affects title, I can't share any of their personal financial history with the buyer. So you got to keep certain things secret, but offers themselves are not necessarily confidential. And it says that right here, offers are not necessarily confidential. And what that means is Offers are only confidential in what they contain in the offer if there's written confidentiality agreements between all of the parties, buyers, buyer's agents, sellers, listing agents, all of those people have to have a confidentiality agreement signed. And I guarantee none of you guys do. Okay. So what that means is this, is that we're just letting them know that your offer may not be confidential. So uh, that, that information that's in your offer that we submit on your behalf, whether I represent the listing or not, Somebody else may know what is contained within that offer. The listing agent can share it, right? And, and as a matter of fact, I encourage you guys to not withhold information like that, right? Because our job as a listing agent is to make sure that we obtain the best offer, the most money, the best terms that we can for our sellers. 
And so if I get three or four offers and then somebody calls me and says, Hey, I want to submit an offer. And I tell them, well, I've got four offers already. Usually that discourages buyers from, from continuing on or moving forward because they're like, Oh, they already have four. And the next question that the buyer asks is, okay, well, what's your best offer? And inevitably all listing agents say, well, I can't tell you that just submit your best offer. Right. Inevitably all listing agents say that, but what's to stop me when the buyer's agent says, what's your best offer from saying, okay, well, I got four offers. My best one right now, the number one offer, the one that's in the lead is at this price with this down payment with no concessions. And this is the offer that we're probably leaning towards, even though I'm going to counter multiples. Now what happens is if that buyer has the ability to improve their offer to meet it, they'll submit it. If they know they can't con compete with that offer, then they won't waste their time and submit. Because I, I have conversations with agents and, and especially like, I mean, it's, it's been a weird up and down market, right? And, and in the past, it was, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 offers that we would get on a property. I remember talking to, to agents, you know, a year ago, year and a half ago, where they were like, oh, we got 40 offers and we don't know what to do with all of them, right? And it, it does become daunting. But now we're still in a position where we, you know, if things are priced properly and inventory is still so low that there is still multiple offers. It may not be 20 or 40, but it's, you know, five or 10. And it still is a lot of work to present all five of those offers or the 10 of those offers, decide which ones you're going to counter, do all that stuff. Why not give yourself a position where you're not presenting offers or having to deal with an offer that you know is, un, is not competitive with the rest of the offers. So if, for example, if I say to the buyer, look, we got three offers, one's at this, one's at this, one's at this, none of them are asking for credits and all of them are 20% down. If that buyer can't compete, the chances are they're not going to submit the offer. But if they can, they are, and I'm going to have another choice to make based on those terms that I shared with them. And I'm going to share those terms with them, even if it's my own offer, even if one of those three that are going to get multiple counters is my own. I'm going to share it because guess what? Those, that new one that comes in is also not confidential. So I'm going to go back to my buyer and I'm going to call them and I'm going to say, Hey buyer, I got another offer in. here's what your competition is doing. This is their price. This is their down payment. This is what they're doing for escrow period. Do you want to beat it? Or do you want me to present your offer as, as written? What do you want to do? And let my buyer direct me. And if my buyer says, no, nah, leave it as is, I'm still going to push my buyer because it's my buyer, but I'm going to present all the offers. And if the seller ends up taking another offer, well, then so be it. That's how the job works. But what we do as listing agents generally is we don't share that information with anybody. And the ones who are the hardest to get any information about their multiple offers are the ones that usually have their own offer because I'm going to shut the door on everybody else so I can double end. But is that really what's in the best interest of our seller? If we are really doing our job the right way, our job is to do what's in the best interest of our seller to get them the best deal, not to 100% ensure that we double in. Now, do we want you to double in? Absolutely. You should be trying to double in every one of your deals. You get a listing, you should be trying to sell it yourself. You should be going for 100% of the paycheck. But sometimes you don't have the buyer that's the best. And for you to cut off the buyers that are the best, just to make sure that your buyer is the one that gets it. It's not good customer service, guys. So again, here is where we get the, the permission to act as a dual agent. And we disclose to them how offers are not confidential and how the market works when there's multiple buyers and sellers. Questions about the PRBS before I move on? Uh, I, I do have a question, Kyle. Sure, Danny, go ahead. Okay, so... Um... I'm not representing anybody in a, in a particular situation or particular uh, transaction, right? I do have uh, seven offers on the property at this time. Um, there is one particular offer that is extremely low. Um, do you recommend me calling that agent and say, hey man, everybody else is, a, is like 25, maybe $50,000 higher than you. Do you want to do this? Do you want to change your price range now, or do I just go ahead and wait for the sellers to give them a counter? Well, I mean, at this point, it's already been submitted. I wouldn't call them and say, hey, you want to change it? I would just present it as submitted and either reject it or counter it. The, the, okay. See, the problem, the, the, here's the issue that, and this is, again, why I like to share this stuff is that if, if maybe if the conversation had been at the beginning, like, because buyer's agents are so afraid to ask. I mean, that, that buyer's agent probably never even asked you what your best offer no. was. They didn't yeah, ask. No, they didn't. And, and I'm, no, and I'm guessing, 
Yeah. And I'm guessing there's a bunch of agents on here that have represented buyers and are afraid to ask that question because they know what the answer is going to be. They know that the listing agent is going to be like, I can't tell you, which is not true, but we still have to have communication with them. Right. So like the question shouldn't, maybe the question shouldn't be what's your best offer. Maybe the question should be for a, you know, becoming the norm for us as buyers agents is this is what I'm planning on offering. Am I wasting my time? <laughs> the chances that are you're going to get, the chances are you're going to get a better response than just submit your best offer, but you're still going to get just submit your best offer, right? You're still going to get that. In this case. Now this guy's already submitted Danny present it as it is and either choose to counter him or don't. Maybe you don't counter him because of the discrepancy, right? That's sometimes that's going to happen. If I have three offers at 700,000 and one at 650, $50,000 is a huge gap. I'm probably going to stick with just the sevens and, you know, present to my seller and have my seller reject that 650. But that's a, that, that becomes a choice for you, whether or not you want to write that fourth counter offer or not, you know? Okay. So, but All I, right. but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out of my way to call them and say, Hey, do you want to improve your offer now? And say, no, you I mean, no, you, you took the initiative to put this one in. I'm assuming that's your best foot forward. Here's what we're going to do now, you know? But but I, so, I, would, so, I would start if if you have buyers agents that are willing to communicate with you and you're a listing agent, I'd be open to the idea of like, hey, this is where we're at, man. Because what it's going to do is it's going to start to reduce the bad offers I get and maybe increase the good ones. Correct. Because if, I think if some, the situation. I, I think, no, go ahead. If the situation were different and I was representing that person that had, had uh, 50000 dollars less or a hundred thousand dollars less if i had that that initial offer at that point in time it would be my due diligence as a buyer agent to say hey man uh, yeah. it's it's it let's go let we i would recommend you go higher but it's yeah. your discretion it's your it's your decision um this is where i'm at absolutely absolutely if okay. i'm the, if, it's, okay, if it's your buyer if it's your buyer now that you like you submitted early or whatever the case was and now the price is higher and you in your or you get a buyer that comes in and says, no, I really want it 650. You're the listing agent. Come on, you could do it. No, you, at that point, you're to say, no, I've got three other offers, you know, at 675 and higher. If, if you really want it, you know, you can't deny somebody that you'll submit an offer on their behalf, but you got to tell them the truth. Hey, if you want this, you got to be at that. I'll submit your 650, but I'm telling you right now, you're not going to win at that amount because I'm not going to push you over the better options for my seller. You got to be honest. I completely understand. Thank you so yeah. much for your advice. No problem. Virginia, yes, you had your hand up. I guess just to add to that, one thing that that dem demonstrates is that they don't have that motivation because if they came in pretty low, that means the motivation is kind of lacking. And that should be one of the factors, I think, in deciding. Uh, again, just giving you some extra yeah. information. Well, no, of course. But, but I think, I think too, this is one of the things that I, I think... Um, you know, because of the the shift in the market and where where we came from, right? That craziness that we had COVID and post COVID for those those couple of years. Most of you guys became order takers, right? Because there really wasn't negotiating. It was it's listed for seven hundred. You better write an offer for seven seventy five, or you're not even going to get any consideration, right? And it was. It was just like, hey, I'm going to try to go as high as I possibly can, and we're going to write whatever offer we can. And that's, it was order taking, right? And so at that, at that point, you just did whatever your buyer said, or you, you told the buyer, this is what we have to do to get your offer accepted. And they were like, okay, because it was a frenzy. And now when things switched and the way it was portrayed to the public, not necessarily for us in the business, but and even some of us in the business, in the public, is that the buyers out there seem to believe that somehow there's bargains. And so I think that what happens is, is it's maybe like Virginia said, motivation, maybe it's not their motivation, but it's their lack of education in what's happening in the market. Because I, I do see sometimes that there are some motivated buyers. Obviously they're motivated because they're still trying to buy with interest rates that are 3% higher than they were two years ago, right? They, they're, they're not deterred by those interest rates. They still want to buy. So there is some level of motivation. I think the, the, the issue that we're dealing with is lack of education and the lack of education is because the buyer's agents that are buyer's agents today in this market that we're working in are also a little less educated than they need to be. So they're not really sharing with their buyers the truth 
And, and this is not new for buyer's agents. This is buyer's agents through time have always tried to paint a rosier picture for their buyers than maybe exists in real life because I don't want to lose my buyer, right? So I think that we have to look at it. There's probably a combination of not necessarily a lack of motivation, maybe not the best motivation and, and a lack of education and, and, and a, a weaker buyer's agent, maybe right? We have to look at those things. I think to, in today's market, if you're going to be a buyer's agent, your skills have to be better than they have been in the last four years. <clears throat> so again, remember what, what I hear that and, and remember it is your skills. You have to have skills as a buyer's agent. This is not just, I write up offers and send them in. I have to be able to not only sell to my buyers, but I've got to sell my buyers, right? I got to do everything I can. I got to take those extra steps with the listing agents, communication, emails, follow-ups, push. I got to, I got to do those things. So there's some skills now that are involved that I think buyers agents for the past four or five years haven't had to have. And so if you've, if you started in this business, in this, in this period of those last four or five years, you, you're going to have to really start working on skills. Virginia, your hands up again. Sorry, Kyle. It's okay. No. Um, so, so right, right now, and you're so that is so true. Um, I got an offer on the Southgate property, and you know we're, we were getting constant, you know, offers. Mm. Um, one in particular, it it I didn't catch it until after an offer was decided that it came in from DocuSign where they just forwarded it to me, right, and didn't even have the address, just document from DocuSign or something. So I thought, oh, it's, you know, one of my documents that my client signed off on. Well, it turned out that it was an offer. Mm -hmm. um, of course, once we uh, accepted an offer, she's calling to follow up. And I said, you sent the offer a week ago, no follow up. First of all, you didn't even put the address. You didn't even, you know, right. didn't even look professional. I'm sorry, I yeah. didn't even present your offer. Is that something that could affect me legally as, an, as the <laughs> seller's agent? Yeah, never tell somebody, hey, I didn't present your offer, number one. Well, I presented it after the fact, yeah, but, that's fine. you know, it didn't make a decision. I mean, it didn't change. Yeah, it didn't change. No, no, that's fine. That that happens. That's okay. But it just, since you brought that up, every offer has to be presented. So you guys could be in escrow for 29 days about to close and somebody sends you an offer, you still have to present it. Okay, so keep that in mind. Just so you know, don't ever tell somebody you're not going to present their offer. Okay. Just because I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Like they could go back and report you to the board and to this MLS and you, nobody wants to deal with that nonsense. No. And I told her I'm going to present it, but we've already made a decision, yeah. but I'll present it to see yes. if it's going to alter his you know, well, decision. No, no, but, it, 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 it's not going to, it can't alter his decision. All she could do is become a backup. You're, I've already accepted an offer. I can't change my mind now that your offer came in, but we can make you a backup if he chooses to. But, but, but I guess my it. point is there is, isn't there any protocol, like legal protocol or professionalism when submitting an offer? Well, like, yeah, yes. I mean, there should be some level of professionalism, but that's the, that's the thing is like, that's what I'm talking about is that there has to be some skills. Those skills haven't been necessary. And I would say that probably the majority of the, of the offices and companies and the agents are out there they've never over the last three or four years they have never even sought out the idea of a skill on how to represent buyers and a system and what to do i mean that's something that i teach here i don't think that that's something that happens across the board and so yeah should there be absolutely there should be does that mean that everybody's going to do it no there isn't because there's no set standard nothing that says that this is how you have to do what you have to do there's just here's the forms question yes go ahead um kyle okay so mm -hmm. virginia didn't present an offer right well she uh, did she ultimately did she did say i'm not going to but she okay. said she did okay okay what if what if they don't what if they don't present the offer what do we do like, okay I so, this guy, like so send the last page that it's rejected and he's he doesn't angel and patty they don't get back yeah to me okay at all. So then you can, you report them to the board and it's two violations. It's a CRMLS violation and it's a DR, it's a DRE violation. If they're and part so, of our board, what if they're not part of our board? It doesn't matter. It's a, oh. it's, it's oh. part of the they CRMLS violation. Okay. They, there's, there's a code and I'll email me later and I'll find the code if you guys want and that you send them in writing this code. And if they don't present that to you, 
they don't present that they don't give you that page and you report them i think it's like a 1750 dollars mm -hmm. fine that they receive for not uh giving you the proof of presentation and rejection okay. um and then derek in the in the yeah. chat says would an agent saying i will only be presenting the top five offers be the same thing yeah they have to legally they have to present all offers that they receive they can't say that they're not now if they have something in writing from their seller like if their seller puts in writing my instruction is i only want the best five offers then the listing agent has to follow the direction of their seller and that would protect them if they got a violation right if somebody com complained to the board about them then they could present that letter and say hey i've been instructed by my client that this is all he wants and then they won't get in trouble but um, only if they have uh, written instruction from their seller that they're taking the top five but you otherwise you can't limit who submits an offer okay all right wire fraud we're not going to go through this one all you need to do is make sure that you tell your clients do not wire anything to anybody without first checking with me that's it just be careful because that's wire fraud is still running rampant people have these spoof emails that look like the real thing and your clients are wiring thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to the wrong people and they're out the money so do not wire anything without first consulting me okay by phone even if you get an email from me by phone only we're going to talk before you wire anything all right here we go purchase agreement i finally got there all right so date prepared pretty straightforward the date we're writing the offer right so for writing the offer today it's today this is an offer from buyer it's the buyer's legal name so please make sure i would double check that you have an id from the buyer to make sure you're using their full legal name number one because that's their legal name and it needs to be used in order for them to record the title and do all the things like the vesting for the property plus the lender needs that purchase agreement to match their legal name okay so if it doesn't right so we have you know we know tons of people that either go by their middle name to, you know forget their first name we know them by that by that familiar name but we have to use their legal name so please make sure that you're putting their legal name in there this is an offer from buyer's name that means the buyer's name could be a individual an entity right a, a corporation an llc a partnership a trust uh you know uh, whatever it is it could be an entity is also the name of the buyer and there's two other things that could go in there and those things are and or assignee and but the other thing that you could put is at all e-t-a-l two words at al right so and or assignee is if i am going to be purchasing a property but i also have a corporation and i haven't made a decision yet on the property i'm purchasing whether i want that to be my personal property or i want it to be held by my corporate entity i put and or assignee and within the first 17 days of acceptance i can choose to assign that to my corporation or to another buyer completely because i wrote and or assignee and i my offer was accepted like that if the seller doesn't counter me on that assignee then i have the right in the first 17 days to assign it to anybody i want after 17 days passes i no longer have that ability to assign it to anybody okay so that's what i would write buyer's name and or assignee at all what it means is me right so i'm the buyer kyle strata at comma at all means me and like basically it's latin and it means everybody else in the world right it's anybody else to be named so what that uses what that's used for and it's not used very often but what that's used for is for example we want to jump on a property right we see something comes up it fits i got to take action and hurry we've just barely started the process of getting qualified and i qualify but i need a co-signer right my lender tells me you qualify we just need one co-signer but we need to get active on writing an offer so i write kyle estrada at all that's because i want to add later somebody else to be a co-signer now i could do the and or assignee with that also if i wanted to if i didn't know who my co-signer was going to be because we're going to have to do an assignment of agreement addendum anyway when we find that person whether it's written kyle estrada at all or kyle estrada and or assignee okay so 
those are the things that could be in that buyer line. The buyer's name, the entity's name, and or assignee and at all. That's all that's going to be in that section. Now, Deborah wrote in there, I have three buyers for one property. I only see two lines for signatures. Yes, because there is only two lines for signatures, but all three, all three names are going to go in that buyer section. And then you're going to use a form called an additional signature addendum. And the third buyer that can't sign this purchase agreement, their name's going to go on that additional signature addendum, and they're going to sign that form. You'll send it with your offer, and it's as if they're signing the RPA. Okay. <clears throat> so next, property be acquired is situated. It's the address. So it's the street address, the city it's in, the county it's in, and the zip code it's in. That's what you're going to put there. The assessor parcel number or numbers. They've put space there to if you have to have multiple assessor parcel numbers because maybe that street address contains multiple parcels. They've been tied together. Now, <laughs> excuse me. If the property has a physical address. I don't require that you put the parcel numbers in unless there's multiple. If it is a vacant lot or something like that, that doesn't maybe have a physical address, then you must put the parcel number. Jesus, you have your hand up. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, yes, I was going to make a comment to the person who asked about the third, third three buyers on the contract. Also, mm -hmm. it's very common. Some other agents, they put just their name, their signature typed. And, uh, and they don't use that additional signature addendum. I know it's wrong, but a lot of them do that. So just heads up. Yeah, I mean, that's, that happens. The, again, going back to the idea of wh who, who we deal with in the marketplace, the agents are not educated and then that makes the buyers uneducated. So that the right way to do it is additional signature addendum. Yes, people do do it the opposite way where they do digital signatures and they put the extra person on and they do all that stuff. It's still valid. It's just not right. Right. So we always, as professionals, we want to do it the most right. The most right is additional signature addendum. Is it wrong? I won't call it wrong because it's, it's acknowledged. It's signed. It's on the paperwork. They're, they're agreeing to the offer. I'm not that part as on the listing side, if I get an offer that way, not going to be a pain in the ass to the buyer's agent about it. Okay. But, but keep in mind that as people, as list, especially listing agents, because I believe that listing agents, ultimately, they've gotten to a place in their business where they're a little bit more educated in uh, the business and how forms work and contracts and protecting their clients. Listing agents are probably going to get to the point where they're requesting it and making sure that you do things right, just because listing agents love to make it hard on you guys as buyer's agents, okay? So just try to do things as right as possible. That's always my, my uh, advice, okay? So terms of the purchase are specified below and, the, and, uh, and on the following pages. Buyer and seller are referred to herein as the parties. Brokers and agents are not parties to this agreement. We're not parties to the agreement, which means anything that has to be negotiated between us as brokers, right? Whether that means the seller is negotiating some kind of change with us, the buyer is negotiating something with us, right? So, uh, for example, a, 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 a buyer's agent providing a credit to a buyer from their commission in order for the buyer to be able to close. That doesn't have to be referenced in any of the documents that pertain to this purchase agreement. Okay. Because that's between buyer and buyer's agent. Everything that happens in this package of forms for the transaction, whatever amendments, whatever addendums, whatever uh, purchase agreements or SIPs or whatever is incorporated, those are only to be negotiated on terms between buyer and seller. Buyer and seller. There should never be any references to commissions. There should be never any references to to credits from from agents to sellers or agents to buyers. None of that stuff. It's only what pertains to the buyer and the seller and what they've negotiated together. Only thing that we're going to reference the agents on here is confirming that relationship. So remember at the beginning, and we talked about the disclosure regarding agents relationships and how you can be the three ways you can be represented. This is now confirming that relationship. So if a cooperating broker is representing the buyer on my listing, then the seller's brokerage firm is Century 21 All-Stars. And we're the broker for the seller, right? We would check that box. And the seller's agent is me. I'm representing just the seller right? If 
we're representing both. It's still going to be a Pierce Century 21 All-Stars, and we're going to check both buyer and seller, dual agent. And then we're going to put my name and check both buyer and seller, dual agent. And then we're going to put my the company license number and my license number in there. Now, please make sure you're putting you're putting the license numbers in. Please make sure you're putting the license numbers in. If you get an offer on your listing and the license numbers aren't in there, then you gotta you gotta counter all of this confirmation stuff. Okay, clarify the confirmation. You have to do it. Okay, but you put the brokerage firm the brokerage firms in there, the agent's names in there, their license number. And that's it. Now, if more than one brokerage, right? Like you guys have a co-listing with an outside broker and you're writing in a, and you're getting an offer on the, on the, on the, on the co-listed property, you have to make sure this is checked and you have to include the ABA form, the additional broker acknowledgement. Those have to be included. Okay. Same thing for a buyer's agent. If there's two buyers agents representing a buyer and they work for different brokerages, you have to check this box and you have to include the ABA. Okay. Questions up to that point. I had a question. Um, yes. So if, if, you, if you check the box, see more than one brokerage represents, but if this is the RPA, why would the seller be checked? Oh, that's if they know. That's if they know. Yeah, but but if they don't know, you still got to counter it and include the ABA back. Oh, okay, makes right? sense. Right. So like if the so here's here's what should be happening now. when there's an additional brokerage, like there there should be on the MLS when there's a co list, right? Yes, it says yes. it's a co list, and it should show what the brokerages are. Again, as a good buyer's agent, and I know what I'm supposed to do. I have the skills. I'm writing the offer. I should be checking that box and checking Absolutely. off the seller. So that I'm requesting that ABA to come back, but most agents don't do that. So if I'm the listing agent and I get it and I know that we're co-listed and it's an additional broker, I'm going to counter that and I'm going to include that ABA form. Okay. You. You're welcome. Okay. It references here, the PRBS, what we talked about, the potentially competing buyers and sellers. So it's just saying that that's included in this offer. Now, here is all the terms, paragraph three. Terms of purchase and allocation of cost. The items in this paragraph are contractual terms of the agreement. Referenced paragraphs provide further explanation. This form is 16 pages. The parties are advised to read all 16 pages. Now, I see this a lot with you guys still that you're referencing this paragraph when it comes to this term of the contract. It is not. It is this paragraph, paragraph three, all of the terms that we're negotiating are in paragraph three, everything, paragraph three, these paragraph numbers, 5B, 32A, all that stuff, those are explanations. I don't need to reference that in a counter offer. I don't need to talk about it. This is not like if I'm countering expiration of offer. Nowhere am I going to reference paragraph 32A because that is just an explanation. The expiration of the offer exists right here in paragraph 3C. So everything that we've negotiated, everything that we're going to negotiate and discuss and all the terms of the contract fall under paragraph 3. And that's it. Nothing else. These, again, are just for us to go back to a reference for a deeper explanation. So when we're going through this purchase agreement with our buyers and we're filling it out, everything we need to worry about is here. What we're going to go here is if you need a further explanation of any of these things that we're negotiating, this is where you go to read it in these 16 pages that we're advising you to read all of. Does that make sense, guys? So when you're referencing anything in the purchase agreement, all of these things in this you know, spreadsheet or whatever you want to call them or whatever you graph, whatever you want to call it. They're all paragraph three. All of them are paragraph three. It's not G3 only. It's paragraph three, G3. Paragraph three. So keep that in mind. I want to kind of drive that point home because the conversations I have with people, I'll get questions on, hey, well, in paragraph 5C2, uh, about additional, five, I'm like, 5C2, what are you talking about? It's 3E2. Okay, paragraph three, not paragraph five. 
These paragraphs are, again, just for explanations of this negotiated contractual term. Fair enough. Everybody got it? Got it. Okay, good. All right, let's look at purchase price. Purchase price, pretty straightforward. What are we offering? That's it. So you're going to write that number in there. Now, if the, proper, if the offer is all cash, you're going to check the box. What happens when I check the all cash box is it grays out some things that doesn't allow me to input any longer because there's apparently there is no loan, right? Most of the time it doesn't include an appraisal when it's all cash. So if it is all cash, go ahead and check it off. If your buyer is obtaining some kind of hard money loan or private financing, please don't check all cash because hard money loans, private financing, all those things, they still do have conditions and you want to give them an opportunity to make sure that they can fulfill those conditions and not get locked into the purchase. Okay. Close of escrow days after acceptance. I, I know that there's some things that close faster, right? 21 days, all that stuff. I like to stick with the 30 just because experience and history has taught me that a lot of those 21 day escrows or shorter escrows end up going longer anyway. So let's take some of the pressure off and let's just stick with a 30. Um, you may need longer days for escrow period, depending on things that you're doing. Like, uh, you know, if there's a tenant involved or something of that in nature, you might need a longer uh, escrow period. But for all intents and purposes, when we first draft the the uh, offer, it's going to be 30 days after acceptance. That's going to be the norm. That's what you're going to normally do. Or they have a specific date. I usually don't use that unless there's some reason for that specific date. Like, I've had a conversation with the listing agent. The listing agent is saying, hey, listen, we can't close before, you know, August 10th. Okay, great. But we want to get our offer accepted. So we're going to make our close date August 10th. Okay. Unless there's a specific reason for that date, we're not going to put that. We're going to do 30 days after acceptance. And if we need to do extensions, we'll do extensions. Or if we want to close sooner and everybody agrees, we close sooner. Right? You can. Okay. All right. So. That's for close of escrow. Please make sure you put something in there. And these boxes that are here, check them when you're using it. Because technically, I mean, again, we're getting to technicalities. If the box isn't checked, it's not part of the contract. Okay, so check the box, put the 30 days. Okay, your expiration of offer. All offers by default expire three calendar days after the buyer signs it. All the buyers sign it. Or I can put a specific date and it expires at 5 p.m. on that date or three days after I wrote the offer. So if I have a conversation with a listing agent and I call the listing agent, I say, hey, I'm submitting an offer today. And the listing agent says to me, we're not going to present offers until next Wednesday. Okay, today's Thursday. Next Wednesday is six days from now. My offer is going to expire on Sunday. So technically, if my offer is expired on Sunday, they don't need to present it because it's expired. So if I know that they're not going to present till next Wednesday, what am I going to do? I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, okay, well, next or yeah, next Wednesday, next Wednesday is what the 17th of May. I'm going to write there that my offer expires on May 18th to give them time to present my offer. Now, if I'm a listing agent, and I get all my offers and they're all three calendar days and I'm not presenting until next Wednesday. When I do my counter offers, I'm going to counter back and I'm going to say to those buyers, buyer is acknowledging that the offer dated on, you know, 511 is still valid for this transaction, right? That it is an expire, that it hasn't expired. Or buyer to acknowledge that buyer, that, that offer with expiration date of, 514 is still valid. Okay. Because I don't want later for them to say, well, no, we, that offer was expired and we had a different offer or vice versa. Okay. So you have to address it. You can't just ignore it. Okay. So we're at 1156. We're going to stop there. We'll continue uh, next Thursday and, um, and move forward from there in the purchase agreement. I'm going to stop the share now. Does anybody have any questions before I let you guys go? No? No questions? I see a lot of people unmuted. Okay, who's first? Debbie, go ahead. Hi, yeah. Um, you said something about DocuSign. So with this, 
this is my first, obviously. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, uh, what you're talking about is this is all through DocuSign, right? It's not, uh, well, when I'm filling it out, I fill it out in DocuSign. Is that where I do it? No, you're going to fill it out in zip forms through the CAR, right? You're going to fill out there. Now, you don't have to use DocuSign. CAR and zip forms have their own free signature um, uh, digital ink that you can use. Okay. And it has uh, the ability to set up transactions so that if you have a representative capacity, like a representative that's signing on behalf, right? Like a, a trust or a, mm -hmm. or, a, or, a, or a corporation that you can designate somebody to sign on behalf of that corporation since they're the seller. And it'll, it'll uh, reflect that in the digital signatures. And for additional signature addendums like you have with your three buyers, two buyers names will go on the purchase agreement and one buyer's name will go onto the additional signature addendum. And that's how the digital signatures will be set. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gilbert, but I'm guessing that that is uh, Maricela that has a question. So go, oops, I, I muted you by accident. Go ahead and unmute Gilbert. Go ahead. Oh, it's not a question. Just thank you, Kyle. Thank you oh. for, for being back. Just uh, welcome back, Kyle. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad it went well. I was a, uh, uh, I was a little, I felt a little rusty, but I think it went pretty good. Um, Veronica, did you have a question? I saw you're unmuted. Virginia. Oh, Virginia, was that you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Virginia. Uh just really quick. So going back to the expiration. So if mm -hmm. the contract does expire and we counter, should we reference anything that the um, offers expired? Yeah. Or what um, do you do in that case? Do you have them rewrite it? Did I not say that? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I missed it. No, Sorry. in your, yes, you, I, that's what we just talked about. You have to counter it. So you're going to counter that the buyer's acknowledging that that offer is still valid, even though it's past the expiration date. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Anybody else? All right. Would Thank that you be, guys so would that much. be an amendment? Um, or no, it's going to go in your counter offer. It oh, needs okay. to go in your counter offer. So no, not an you amendment. You just need to state it that the buyers know that. Okay. Yep. 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 Thanks. They're acknowledging that that offer is still valid so that there is no question later. Perfect. All right. Anything else, guys? No. Nope. All right. Well, go enjoy lunch. Thank you for being here. I'm happy to be back and I look forward to continuing this next week. Have a great day, guys.